Hallelujah, hallelujah, grace and peace, grace and peace to you all. Come on into this room with us here for another wonderful session of Lifeline. Bless God for all of you. I thank you and greet you in the name of the Lord tonight. Um, I don't want to tie us up into too much of salutations. My prayer is that you have been on prayer with us. You've downloaded our app, and you know, I'm going to continuously bring that up so that you'll have it. And um, I want to welcome all the guests from uh, here in the studio audience, the local body, and those of you in, you know, in the international community. You know, I see you coming on. You're touching bases with me from time to time. I always want to know where you're logging in from as well. So feel free to interact on whatever streaming mechanism you're on, whether it be YouTube or Facebook or however you're getting on with us. I just want to make sure that I connect with you from time to time. Amen. We've been diving into these teachings, and as we get a little bit further into these trumpets, it's going to get pretty hairy, but you know what I'm saying? It's going to get pretty, uh, pretty deep, you know what I mean? So we're doing some things in that regard. So let's go to God in prayer because I, don't, I have too much to release tonight, and I don't want to spend too much time in, in salutations. Go, let's go to God in prayer with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, your people are gathered. Thank you so much for everything that you continuously do for us, Lord God. How merciful you are to us, Lord God. There is no one else that can show us this level of love, this level of mercy, this level of grace. We pray now, Lord God, that if we've done anything, whatsoever it may be, in word or thought or deed, that was against your throne, we repent right now in the precious name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, for the blood atonement. It gives us the opportunity to be cleansed and washed. We thank you, Lord God, that we don't need to make an appointment, but at any given time, we can come before your throne. And with a repentive and a broken and a contrite heart that you will never reject, you give us an opportunity, Lord God, to be cleansed and to stand again. Thank you for answered prayer. I pray that, Lord God, you'll guide my spirit tonight, Holy Spirit. You'll allow me, Lord Father, to open my mouth and to articulate your words. Let me be nothing more than an echo of your glory. That the people will receive the word, even into my own ear gates, that I shall receive it as well. And that we'll come into a level of understanding of what you have expectation of us, Lord God, in the prophetic and the now, Lord God, that we live in. We give you all the grace, glory, and honor, and seal these in all prayers. In the unmatched and unfailing name of Yeshua the Christ, as we together say, Amen and amen. Glory be to God, saints of God. I want you to turn your Bibles, if you would. Uh, here again, if you see me kind of pressing in, it's because I'm in a vein. I've been there all night. I've been there all day. And the Spirit of the Lord has been taking me in. And I want to definitely take the time to break this down. You know, so much to this portion here as we're diving into part six of this teaching and the fifth trumpet sounding. The fifth trumpet sounding. So much has gone on already amen 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 coming out of the seven seals the seventh seal introducing the seven trumpets and you'll see after hearing the seventh trumpet how that at the seventh trumpet will introduce the seven vials or the seven bowls don't want to be you know you know uh taking this lightly not for yourselves we talked about the rapture of the church we talked about those leaving i don't want you to get giddy on the fact that you might be there and getting ready to leave you know before all these these judgments begin to happen um you know because you might just get shocked the who make it in bless god amen okay so we want to make sure that we're always wearing the heart of god the heart of christ and to go out and perform what he says for us to perform to perform you don't buy this as a bus ticket to heaven it's not that type of situation all right, you have to make sure that you're living that life in accordance to God's word. You know what I mean? That you're staying steadfast and unmovable. That's how you qualify in that regard. And you know the blood of Christ, you know, standing in, you know, with and for you. But you have generations of your lineage. You are here in this particular time frame, and you are having children or grandchildren, or you are a part of some level of a family of that nature. That somewhere along the line, whether it's a niece, a nephew, or whatever it is. They will be going through these situations here. What you learn today, it shows you the embodiment and why it's important for you to go out and decree God's word to his people. It is important that you set the example because they will not know if you do not train them. They will never know if you do not train them. So don't get giddy on the fact that, hey, the church is raptured out of here and I'm gone. Wrong. All right? Because you're not loving anyone if you leave them aimless and they don't know. Amen? 
Amen. Let's go here to Revelations again. Um, last time you were here, I do want to back up just a little bit. We dealt with the fourth angel, and um, I usually do a quick little recap. Tonight I'm going to just zone in a little bit more to the fifth angel. But there is a portion of this that from the last teaching that I did not get a chance to tell you. And I want you to turn your Bibles, and we're going to look at it together in Revelations 8 and 13. Revelations 8 and, t and 13. Let's start there first, and then we'll bring it on in to the fifth angel sounding the trumpet. Revelations 8 and 13. Now, when you see it on your screens in Revelation 8 and 13, you're going to see a couple of scriptures, the first one being the King James Version. There's a reason why I put this up here, because we study. They study. We study to show ourselves approved, and so it's important that we look over the scriptures to do cross comparisons of what it is that we're seeing. Amen? Revelation chapter 8, and the first one that you've seen on your screens here is the King James Version of it. Let's look at some cap comparisons. It says here, and I beheld and heard an angel. Say angel. angel. Hallelujah. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. We see that in King James. But look down here at the Amplified. It says here, then I looked and I heard a solitary eagle. Hmm. Let's drop down a little bit further and look at the message version of the Bible. I looked hard and I heard a lone eagle. Let's drop down from them and look at the NIV. I, as I watched, I heard an eagle. And come and drop down now to the New Living Translation. He says, then I looked and I heard a single eagle. That's extremely important, saying to God, because it's not suggesting it is not part of the angelic host. But an eagle, you know, is symbolic. All right? Taking a range high in the sky and overlooking all things, you know what I'm saying? The precedence or the presence of the eagle, you know what I'm saying, has a command element to it, you know, in Scripture. All right, I'm going to be touching base on that as we go a little bit further into this. But I needed you to see that, you know, it's just not as, just as simple as just an angel. There, there was some definition given to this angel. And in the breakdown of the text, you know, and, and the canonized uh, in a portion of the Bible, the interpretation of that angel um, was a little bit watered down in the King James Version. All right, so we'll touch base on that again. I don't want to go off on that tangent about the eagle and its premise and all that stuff and the power and all that stuff. I'll get into that a little bit later on. What we want to do tonight is we want to hear this fifth angel, you know, sound and what's to be expected from that. Let's dive again now into Revelation chapter 1, I mean chapter 9, right, beginning at verse 1. Revelation chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. Hallelujah. Watch this now with me. And it says, Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star. Stay star. star. Hallelujah fall from heaven onto the earth and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit and he opened the bottomless pit and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air was darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Hmm. And verse 5 says, and to them it was given that they should not kill them. They're not supposed to kill the men, but that they should torment, right? The, the men should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. Let me get a little reverb. Bless God. Amen. Hallelujah. It says here now in Revelation chapter 9 and verse 7. Hallelujah. And the shapes of the locusts 
were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as, were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. Verse 8 says, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth was as teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. But in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, there comes two woes more hereafter. Glory be to God for this word that he's given to us. And to God, we have journeyed through so much in these texts already, and the damage is significant upon the earth and in the stellar community. We have seen that the Lord has damaged the sun, the stars, the moon. You know, it's not shedding light. We've seen that the ecological and hydrological systems of the earth are damaged. We've seen that green grass was burnt up. All right? Obviously, that when we're diving, diving in here to Revelation chapter 9, we see that the grass has grown back. Hmm. See? There's some time frames in there, and you're going to find out, you know, those time frames where you see in that five months, it can raise curiosity. Why is there just five months? Well, there's so much different, you know, uh, symbolic nature connected to that five months, but more practically, you find that from Daniel's revelation, okay? Now, there are three and a half years, a whole seven-year period, three and a half years on one side where Israel is protected, and then three and a half years on the other side where Israel, you know, is persecuted, okay? And this is what you're dealing with in the format of the persecution. So the latter half of the three and a half years in Daniel's prophecy, that 1,260 days that we have recorded there, this is five months, you know what I'm saying, in that time frame, in that three and a half years, all right? This, this is going down, all right? Now, one of the things I want to show you as we journey back up, if you would, to Revelation chapter 9 again, um, beginning at verse 1 again for me, I want to take some time to, to, to deal with the star that is mentioned here, okay? Deal with the star that's mentioned here. If you would, I have a, um, I have a Revelation chapter 9 in multiple versions as well, hallelujah, a comparison of Revelations 9 and verse 1. Let's put that up quick, quick so our viewers can see this, so that you can see again how you, when you study, you go to different you know, passages of Scripture to see if the canonized um, uh, references are synchronized. And here again, here's this. Watch this. It says here for the King James Version, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven onto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Now, when you see this in the, in, the new, in, the, in the King James Version, and you see, I saw a star fall from heaven onto, er, onto the earth, the way that we comprehend things in Western civilization, you may think that this angel and his witnessing of it was at that time that he saw the star fallen. Journey into these other passages with me, and I'm going to show you something, because I made a comment to you when we were dissecting Revelation chapter 8, and I showed you the star Wormwood, as we were talking about that star, and there's a classic difference between each one. Wormwood was an actual meteorite or an asteroid. That's what is in, you know, that's where we just deduced that it would be. This is not that, because this has give, been, been attached with a pronoun, right, when we see here in the Revelations 9, 1 and King James Version, a star fall from, from heaven onto the earth and to him. You see that? And to him, this is not an asteroid. This is not a meteoroid. This is, this is something, this is a physical uh, a creation here. All right? And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. But is this a star that's just falling? I told you back then there were no more fallen stars that already took place. So, so what is John seeing here? Is he seeing a star that's actually falling at that time? 
Let's take a look at the other passages of Scripture, and we see what they, what they actually um, deduced out of, the, of the, um, the, the, the components of the original scripts. Watch this. It says in the New, King's ver New King James Version of the Bible, it says, Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen. Do we see this? I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. Let's look at the New Living Translation right below. The fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen. Do you see this? To the earth from the sky. Look at, look at the NIV. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky and to the earth, and the star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. You'll see what that whole abyss piece means. This is the reason why it's highlighted for you. But just in reference to what we're looking at here, this is talking about an angel that's already a fallen angel. Okay? Not an angel that just fell at the point in time that John was viewing this. We told you that when John started off, right, when, when we started with Revelation chapter 1 all the way through 22, that John is traversing a timeline, all right, of what was what is and what is to come all right and going further now as we're beginning to step into the these these last three woes right the woes all right the fifth the sixth and the seventh trumpet we're going to find that john is going to be you know viewing and casting his vision back on some things that already took place and fast forwarding it into the now and then into the future so he's going to be having this traversing going on with us. And so we're going to go in for a ride, a little bit of a roller coaster ride concerning this when we go forward into those, those extended teachings, okay? But for tonight, we're spending time understanding what's going on with this fifth angel. And we see already from the text, you know, in Revelation chapter 9, that he blows and there's a star that's involved. We already added now that there is a personality connected to this star and a pronoun, so it has a him that's been given some keys. All right? Now, the thing about it is I told you that this, uh, these things that are occurring here have some reference points. Some things that you're going to see in the book of Revelation all right, are going to be highly symbolic, all right? It's the reason why you saw the difference between King James' version saying angel and the other saying eagle, right? It doesn't suggest that the, the angel is not an eagle or does not have a feature of an eagle, all right? We know that those exist. And so, you know, the little pictures of the angels that we have here on earth, the little chubby one that has the, has the, the arrows for love and all the other crazy stuff that we see, you know, that's not what angels look like, saints of God. If you hear the description of some of these things as we go forward, you'll be very scared. Hallelujah. All right? These angels are nothing to play with, you know? Maybe why when they showed up on everybody's doorstep, the first thing they said was, fear not. You know, fear not, because when you see this, you know, it's, it's so much to behold. Angels don't stand in normal height as men. They can take the form of men, but they cannot, in their natural state, they're very big. All right? They're very big. You see an angel now, you might run for the hills. Okay? So that's important because of a couple of things. First things first is that I want you to look at the fact that I told you that many of these situations that are happening with these judgments have been done before. So there are literal sense that is connected to some, and then there's symbolic senses that are connected to others. Let's journey into that for a quick second to see if this ever happened with locusts, as we have here in the fifth trumpet blowing. Exodus chapter 12, let's look at verse 13 through 15. All right, watch your screens. I pray fully that you're taking notes. I pray that I'm not going too fast for you tonight. All right, but I want to take my time so you should get a proper understanding. Say understanding. Hallelujah. Exodus 12, you know, beginning at verse 13. Watch this. And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt. And the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. And the locusts went up all over the land of Egypt and rested in all the coasts of Egypt. Very grievous were they. Mm -hmm. Very grievous were they. 
Before them there were no such locusts as they, neither after them shall be such. Hmm, pay attention to that. All right, so there's a definitive situation with the locusts that's appearing in Egypt and what we're dealing with now. He says, for, verse 15 says, For they covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was darkened, and they did eat every herb of the land and all the fruits of the trees which the hail had left. And there remained not any green thing in the trees or in the herbs of the field through all the land of Egypt. Now, you would recall, right, in Revelation chapter 9, when this fifth angel blows, that these locusts are released from a bottomless pit. You'll also recall that we just read that they were let out from a, from a, from a pit that, that had smoke that came up that pretty much blocked all the rest of the light that was coming from the sun that remained the moon and all that stuff. All right? And there's a lot of heat that's coming out of this pit. We'll touch base on what that pit is. All right, but these locusts that come out here have a different description. They were told not to hurt the green, not to hurt the trees, right? Not to do anything but to torment man five months, all right? Not to kill the man, but to torment them five months upon the earth. As if we haven't dealt with a whole lot already, now we're making it a little bit more personal, and they're getting ready here to come and torment men. The description of this, 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 this locust is, is, is pretty unique. You know, put the pictures up here for me. You know, let's, let's take a look at, w at what they will look like symbolically, all right? Because, you know, by now you can tell that, you know, this may not necessarily be locust in the, the, the more insect stance, you know what I mean, of life, but, you know, definitely they're representing some other things. Some theologians tend to believe that this is false prophets that we're talking about here. But just based on the description, you see the image on the screens, hallelujah, you'll see that, you know, in the description out of Revelation chapter 9, keep the image up for me, it says here that in verse 7, all right, that uh, it says that, the, and the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. Look at this image of this, this, this locust on your screen. And their heads were as it was like crowns of, of like gold, you see that? And their faces were the faces of men. You see that? And their hair, and they had hair as the hair of women. And their teeth was the teeth of lions. You see that? They had breastplates and breastplates of iron. And, you know, their wings fluttering would make a long sound. A lot of people believe that these are helicopters and all kinds of different things. But you know what? Let the Holy Spirit give us wisdom and understanding. All right, because with every generation that comes with any type of mechanized warfare, we tend to believe that these are these locusts. This stuff has not yet happened because we are still here. Okay, this is your marker. The rapture is that marker. Some people don't believe in the marker. Okay, that's all well and fine. But there's biblical evidence of a lot of this, you know, happening after the church has exited. Similarly, you know what I'm saying, as Israel exited. And, you know, once we're exiting certain places, these places are judged, all right, from that standpoint. God protects his church, amen? God protects his people. And so, you know, when you see that, and in, in comparison to what a regular locust looks like, all right, you want to put that image up for me? You see that there's a classic difference between the description. There's a lot of similarities in certain ways because when you talk about locusts, they come and they usually destroy vegetations. All right? Locusts show up and, you know, they'll tear through, you know, acres and acres of crops and vegetation, you know, in just, in just a matter of, you know, a uh, matter of time. And, you know, very destructive are these, 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 uh, these insects. And so um, I believe that the insects and animals, which, whichever one, you know, put them in a category where they fit. Bless God. But I, I, I want to let you realize that the description here is very devastating. With an intention to sting men like scorpions. So you know, and it's a torment, so it's not going to kill you. If a scorpion stings you now, nine times out of ten, you know, you know if you haven't had it treated, you could die. Five months, this is going on. All right? And whether it be symbolic or not, five months, this is going on and being permitted to carry on because God is judging mankind. He told us that he was not going to judge, right, everybody, but those, right, remember this, those that did not have the seal. 
those that did not have the seal. How do you get the seal? How do I protect myself from going through all of this? How do I get the seal? How do the children of Israel in Egypt make sure that their firstborn wasn't killed? They got that seal through obedience. Say obedience. They could have gone ahead and killed the lamb and did what they wanted to do, have a barbecue in the back of the yard, have fun, and you know, do a whole bunch of stuff, you know, prime rib, everything that they wanted to have and chill out. And forget to put the blood mark on the doorpost, and they would have felt the very same effect. It's the reason why God says, yes, I know you are my people. Yes, I know that you've been persecuted. Yes, I know that, that, that you know, the, the, the Egyptians have done you wrong. But me just knowing that and loving on you does not give you permission to dishonor and disobey me. That's what we're doing today, saints of God. That's what we're doing today. You would think that because a grandmother prayed for you or a grandfather prayed for you or a father or mother prayed for you, that that's okay. You know what I'm saying? I'm covered under the blood. I've seen some crazy stuff where individuals take their Bibles and they open it up to the 23rd storm and they put it on their dashboard on their cars and believe that that's some type of force field, you know, while I'm driving on the highways. No, nope, you'll get in an accident and the, car, and, the, and the Bible will burn up. That's God. Because that does nothing for you. He doesn't want it in, in, you know, on the dashboard. He wants it in you. He wants it in you. And we play little games, and they're very ignorant in, the, in, 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 in how we, we, we demonstrate ourselves because we don't have that commitment that I talked to you about the last time we were here. Saints of God, you just don't get that seal because you're you. Those individuals that were sealed specific to this found now in Revelation chapter 7. Now this deals with the 144,000 Jews that are going to go ahead and spread the gospel. But when they spread the gospel, the intent of spreading the gospel is that folks will respond. What's going to happen to them? <laughs> would, would, would the locusts sting them? No. I've listened to theologians say that the only sealed ones was 144,000. But if the 144,000, I put this out here for my, my fellow pastors and my fellow you know, clergymen that are out here and teaching this. If the 144,000 are sealed and sent to do the work, what are they accomplishing? If the 144,000 are the only ones sealed, so that by the time we get in, now this is Revelation 7 I'm talking to you about, so that what is occurring through the... The, the, the breaking of the seven seals, the seven seal judgments. We identified that 144,000 back when we were dealing with the seals, four horsemen and all the devastation that they brought. So what, they, what, what have they been doing since they, their release and, and to go out here all the way to the point of the fifth trumpet blowing? They're the only ones still sealed? Let's make some sense, saints of God. All right? Let's understand and, and, and engage Holy Spirit when we're studying this. So we can understand the whole concept. The concept was that the 144,000 were sealed before this stuff started happening so that they can go out and perform the will of God, presenting the word of God to the people who would repent. Those people who would repent, I would believe that they'll be sealed as well. I would believe that they are sealed as well. Amen? And so this whole thing comes back to this star. Let's take a little refresher and look at Revelation chapter 9 again. Let's, let's, let's just focus your attention on that. Um, you're looking at verse 1 again. And it says, Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from, you know, from heaven onto the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Obviously, this bottomless pit is locked up because it has a key. It's not just easily accessed. And this star that's, that's, uh, that I just showed you had to be a fallen angel already. Not one that was just falling at the point in time that John saw. All right? In the conveyance of the text, you know, in the comparisons to each one of the conveyances, we realize that this was a fallen angel already. Now, let's get to that for a quick second. We understand that the whole, you know, the whole angelic host that was created, Scripture reveals that God has a number of angels. Say number. There are a number of angels. Angels are not born. 
When God created them, he created them, he creates them no more. There's not no manufacturing situations going out there with angels. And we here in the earth have a fantasia, some of us have a fantasia with the angelic realms. There are individuals that are worshiping angels. You have people talk about angel numbers and all this other stuff. Stop your foolishness. You have, no fo you have no angel number to be assigned to you. You are assigned and sent here into the earth to be man. It's tough enough in this particular society to see, to see our, 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 our fellow brothers and sisters struggle with their gender. That's hard enough for us to deal with, yet alone to take on angelic ranks. Let's find out if we're boys first. Let's find out if we're girls first. Before we start looking into the supernatural levels and accessing those things to think that we can dive into that and participate. No, it's higher than that. I want to encourage your spirit tonight so we can cut out some foolishness. Why? Because we have to get aggressive with this stuff, saints of God. This is not for you to come here so that you can get an opportunity for an hour worth of education. No. This information should let you see that God is merciful. This, this, this information should let you see that God is graceful, right? That he's here attempting to give us the time every single day that he gives it to us so that we can start at home. Okay, if you haven't gone into the street, okay, if you hadn't gone on your job, okay, if you hadn't gone into the schools or whatever have you, start at home. What are we teaching each other at home? The television is almost obsolete in comparison to social media. So at one point in time, we had a generation of adults that did not take the time to teach the children. How will they know, saints of God? The television was raising the child. And you wondered why little Tommy or little Jenny wound up acting crazy because, you know, they, their personality was as fickle as the remote. They watched something that was, that, was, that was passive, then they may show a passive attitude. They watched something that was aggressive, they may show you an aggressive attitude. Why? Because the remote control was parenting. Who's doing it today? There used to be a time when parents would monitor what kids would interact with. Now today, that doesn't exist. Back when I was younger, we had little board games. You remember the Ouija board? Some of y'all might remember that. Some of you didn't even know about that. Demonic situations that, and witchcraft that children were involved in themselves in because they sold it as a board game. That's not a game. Little transparency. I wasn't always, you know, well, I didn't know that, but I wasn't always Pastor Sheldon. I had this little curiosity about me sometimes, and so I participated with a Ouija board one day, one time only, because it spelt my name. Oh. You know, do we, do we, do we think it's not real? It's just a game? It's not. It's not. These game consoles that we have, just prior to getting into this message, it would have been too long for me to get here and try to show you all those different diagrams. But I went through and looked for the most you know, proficient games today with angels involved. And you would, you'd be amazed to the stuff that they have out there. There's a, there's a game for the PS5 called Vampire. And it's always seductive. And that's a game? No age limit. No age limit. When was the last time we went through our homes to realize what was really going on in our children's lives? When I grew up, you had no privacy. Your parents would take the hinges off the door. Bless God, amen. We may not be there anymore. You know, a progressive society. You all right? A progressive society. Is that right? So, you see, one of the things about that, saints of God, is you got to understand that anyone who has access, listen to me well, Anyone who has access to your house by permission, listen to me. Anyone who has access to your house by permission has the ability to bring something into your house as an intrusion. You better learn how to pray out your environments. 
These demons are looking for agreement, saints of God. You got to understand, even God is using fallen angels to fulfill these tasks. They exist. They're not just something that's mythical, mystical. It's not a Disney show. It's not a Disney movie. None of that. This is not Marvel. This is not Doctor Strange. This is way beyond that, tapping into these realms. Some folks, I love Marvel, saints of God. I have. Always liked that. You know, the whole Iron Man situation, all that stuff is awesome. However, you went beyond when we started looking at things like Doctor Strange. Why? Because you're touching into whole necromancy and the whole nine yards. And you pass it off as an easy, you know, just sell it off to me as a movie. It can't affect you, this and that and the other. Whose opinion is that? Because all the demon needs is agreement, saints of God. Let me, let me, let me, not get, let me, get, let me get back into the message so I don't keep you all night. Bless God, have you sign off and never look back at me again. Hallelujah. Watch this now. I want you to put up, you know, we're talking about fallen angels right now. I want you to see something here with fallen angels, and I want you to follow me real quick because I don't think we ever had a teaching on this, and we go in, we'll go into some further depths of it, but I want to keep this image up for a minute so I can explain, all right? Follow it with me. In the, in the scriptures, we realize that, the, that there was a revolt in heaven, all right, when Satan solicited one-third of the angels and tried to convince them of some foolishness, and God kicked everybody out. One-third of those angels are no longer classified as how God originally created them. Right? You see at the top here, all angels. Say all angels. Hallelujah. All angels were originally created holy. Right? Because God is a holy God. He created the angels holy. When they rebelled and revolted, this one-third along with Satan, God kicked them out, and they are now known as fallen angels. Two-thirds are still holy, one-third are fallen angels. But these fallen angels fall into some categories, saints of God, that we need to see. Because some of us may be wondering, right? Some of us may be wondering. You can bring it back to me for a quick second. Some of us may be wondering why it is, Father, that I am praying to you against a principality or, 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 or any one of those rulers of the dark world, and it seems like I have to continuously do it. Is there no finality in my prayer that stops them once and for all? Why is it that Scripture reveals that Satan must be released for a thousand years? Why, why is he, You already know he committed the crime. In the system of our justice in the earth, if you know the killer has committed the crime, and within his sentence we have things like parole, yes we do, Right, but there's sometimes, right, that you, you're not just going to go and open up the prison door and says, you know what, we think you've been in here too long. Let me go ahead and give you a, you know, a, a thousand day break. So God, what's really happening here? Why is it necessary with all the stuff that's going on that you know that you're going to defeat Satan once and for all and cast him and, the, and, and his angels into the lake of fire? Why are you even giving him any leeway? If that has never stirred up in your mind, if you've never had that question, if you've been engaging in spiritual warfare and never really wondered why you have to be so consistent concerning it, you'll learn a little something tonight. Let's go back to the image. All right? Of the fallen angels, saints of God, there are three categories of these fallen angels, okay? There are those that operate in total freedom. Sounds ironic, but I'll get to that in a minute. I'll show it to you. There are those that have absolutely no freedom. And there are those who are operating in temporary freedom. Pastor Sheldon, what does that mean? Let's take a look at this stuff as you'll see it for yourself. Total freedom. This is the, the angels that have been given the opportunity or the freedom to wage war. Ephesians chapter 6. Let's take a look at that real quick. Ephesians chapter 6 beginning at verse 10. You see it? Hallelujah. Watch this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power, say power, hallelujah, and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle, say wrestle, 
Hallelujah. If there was no ability for us to engage, this passage would not be here. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, why are we wrestling against them if all of them were defeated? You see, because there are classifications, saints of God. Angels, fallen angels that have been given an opportunity to do some things. Right? The mind of God is a very serious component. His thoughts being above our thoughts. His ways being above our ways. This is why we must seek Holy Spirit. Or when you hear us say, Rauk HaKadosh, the Hebraic name for him. Right? So we can get an understanding. Say understanding. Why? Because this will now begin to shape the prayers. This now shapes my mindset so I know that this is not one time and done, you know, situation with me. That, Lord, I just did learn a real heavy prayer last night, so I'm good. No, you need to give another one about 20 minutes later. Half an hour later. This is why the prayer watches are so important. Why? Because, yes, you can terminate a situation for a duration of time, but you have to be consistent. You have to be committed. If you say to yourself you're going through something and you're only going before the Lord for the situation you're in, you're fooling yourself. You're fooling yourself. I pastor, I've been pastoring for a while, and even Pastor Sheldon has to engage on a different level sometimes and seek the Holy Spirit for a different strategy sometimes. Why? This stuff is real. This fifth angel is real. Sounded a trumpet and a fallen angel has an assignment? A fallen angel has an assignment to open up a pit? A fallen angel? Huh. Let's keep going, right? Let's put it back up here again. Three categories of fallen angels. We dealt here with, with Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Let's go to Daniel chapter 10, beginning at verse 10, right? Recently when Apostle Curtis was with us, such a blessed opportunity we had with him. You know, such, you know, the residual nature of this is still upon our church today. It's a blessings to them, you know, there in Trinidad, him and, 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 and his wonderful wife and their, their, their church. We, we bless God for them. But he also touched on Daniel chapter 10 as well, showing you the king of Persia, right? The king of Persia, the physical entity, and then there was a spiritual component that was behind it territorial type demons right watch this now it says here in, in, in Daniel 10 in verse 10 and behold a hand touched me which was which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands and he said unto me old Daniel great man great uh, a man greatly beloved understand the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright say upright Hallelujah. For unto thee now am I sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before the, by thy God, thy words were heard. And I am come for thy words. You see, when you pray, you got to understand there's a system of angelic activity taking place, right? Can, 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 can the angel come for your words? Hallelujah. Can the angel come for your words or did you not say nothing? You got to utter some stuff into the atmosphere for an angel to come to collect it. Bless God. Amen. All right. But watch this. Verse 13. He says, you know, he said that thy words were heard and I came for thy words. Verse 13 says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia. We dealt with that. This prince is not a physical prince. This is the demonic entity that's behind the king of Persia. Watch this now. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. So for 21 days, there's been a confrontation. Because there is a realm, saints of God, that other activities are taking place in. That's why we cannot be complacent, but we have to be consistent and committed. Our prayers avail much, all right? The effectual and fervent prayer, right, of the righteous avails much. He heard him. We get this superhero type of mentality because the only thing that we have as an example is not that we picked up our word to study to show ourselves approved. We went and saw a movie. 
and we saw Superman, all right, and somewhere along the line, as long as there's no kryptonite, you know what I'm saying, he's off the chain. But you don't realize that there's a major battle ensuing in the other realms. Your prayers are, cons you know, they, they, they contribute to the strength of things. Not just your own strength. <laughs> You're going to learn a lot about that. But this angel dealing here with Daniel shows us that he had leverage. Even though judged and kicked out of heaven, he has the ability to move around. Freedom to wage warfare. Do you understand? Hallelujah. Watch this now. Going back to the image. We have the other category of a fallen angel is the ones that have no freedom at all. These ones that are in eternal bonds. Now let's sit back and look at Genesis chapter 6. And I'm going to paint a picture for you because this is why it happened to them. All right? This is why it happened to them. But let's look at Genesis chapter 6 beginning at verse 1. Watch this now. Here's how these angels got into trouble. And I'll show you what their judgment was like. Hallelujah. Why they have no freedom. And it came to pass when, when, which, when, when man began to multiply upon the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. That the sons of God, do you see that? The sons of God, which is another name for angels. I'll show you some things in a minute about angels and their names. But the, the, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair or beautiful. And they took them wives of all which they had chose. An angel that's stepping out, right, of the dimensional uh, system to interact with women in this realm. That is forbidden. And it is the my primary reason while I'm on it. And you'll see why this situation here is, is, is really crazy because this is where you spawn homosexuality and lesbianism from. <laughs> All those sexual perversion situations, it was, it was never supposed to happen. But they got there and they started getting themselves involved. Let's, let's go back to verse 3 of Genesis chapter 6. Watch this now. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh. Yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God, see it again, angels, came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw the wickedness of man that was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You see that? A fallen angel that sows a seed into a natural woman. A fallen angel that sows a seed into a natural woman. What are you getting ready to, 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 to create? Because you got to understand there are principles, right? Legal, le legal or laws that God set up in the earth. Seeds bear after their own kind. You have violated the kind, and you've morphed us now, you know what I'm saying, into this hybrid type of situation that unleashes a certain level of evil. You've already fallen, so the grace of holiness is off of you as a fallen angel. You, are, you, you, you violated the, you know, the, the interdimensional realms, and you went with sleeping with women. Women had children in the earth. The principles still stand in the earth. Seed time and harvest? The only thing that's attached to money? <laughs> no, a seed was sown. Time ensued. And the harvest of a child came. And with the child, right, entered in now different levels of spirits. Traversing the lands introducing immorality on many levels. This is why God is saying what he's saying in verse 5. Now watch this now. And verse 6 says that it repented the Lord that he had made man upon the earth and it grieved him at his heart. Let's go and back this up right now with 2 Peter 2, verse 4 and 6. I pray that it's making sense to you, but let's show you how I can support this of which I've just told you. Hallelujah. Watch this now. 2 Peter 2 and verse 4 and 6. It says here in verse 4, for if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to where? 
to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness. Do you see this? He delivered them to chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And spared not the old world. But save Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of the righteous, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example or an example unto those who should, you know, that, that should um, live ungodly. Now, 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 notice that they tied in the days of Noah, right, with the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah? When the two angels showed up and they came into the city, men, women, and children surrounded Lot's house with the firm intention of doing what? Sleeping with the angels. Men trying to sleep with the angels in every age group. To the point that the perversion showed that Lot himself turns around and tells them, men, don't do this. I have some daughters. So he rather, rather pimp his daughters out than to stand up for the righteousness. But God, being such a sovereign God, holding on to the merits of covenant that he had with Abraham, saved Lot. Otherwise, he'd have burned up too. But that's why it's drawing this reference here. These angels violated. They are the ones in bonds. All right? They're the ones in bonds. I want to take you to, to, to support that one more place again. All right? Just look at it, you know, with me with Jude chapter 1. All right? Look at Jude chapter 1. It's going to reemphasize it again. This is, I told you it was going to be a little bit more scripture heavy so that you could understand. In Jude chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, I will therefore put you in remembrance... Though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. Right? Another indication that a rapture can happen, or a rapture will happen. He's always saving us before he destroys those that don't believe. Look at verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate... You didn't stay within your ranks. You violated. They left their own habitation. He had reserved them in everlasting what? You see how it's reiterating it? In everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah. You see how he's connecting it? Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, given themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. It had an origin, saints of God. It had an origin. These names are not just being connected for no reason. Jude is prophesying, showing us why these things are occurring and the fact of God's judgment being brought upon the land because of the continuous nature of it. Now it's slipped into the church. You have homosexual pastors. <laughs> really? Really? And we feel that, you know what, we're hurting people when we stand up against sin. We feel like when we open our mouth to say anything to anyone, we are offending people. Listen to me. The mastery of your ministry is when you learn how to represent the Holy Spirit and the kingdom of heaven uncompromised, knowing how to wield your sword, loving the person, and hating the sin. You want mastery in this? That's what you're aiming for. Love the person and hate the sin. Loving someone does not mean that you have to let them love you back. There's no problem. You can love and don't. If your love is contingent on the people loving you, you got a major problem. If the wholeness of your love walk is contingent upon somebody loving you, you have a major issue. You got to learn how to love yourself and love God. Because you're going to offend someone sometimes, saints of God. But you need to stand up for righteousness. You need to stand up for righteousness and not bear tolerance. 
That's not what you were sent to do. You weren't sent to go take the, 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 the scriptures and use it as a, as, as a butcher knife either. So that's why it requires skill. Say skill. That's why it requires mastery. How did Jesus do it? There were times that he went in and overturned tables because you got some people that's just off the chain. And then there are times he goes and he sits next to, you know, a woman at a well and have a conversation with her. He didn't come with judgment and all that kind of stuff. In fact, he, you know, it was almost flirtatious. If some people talked about that. You know, he's like, you know, give me a drink of water, but you don't have a cup. But it ensued a conversation to start. Then we started dealing with her lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, the couple of husbands you have in there, they, they're not your husbands either. But the way that he did it, being a Jew, talking to Samaritan, come on now, skill. So if you're following, you know, as, you know well, me or, or, or Paul, as, we follow, as Paul follows Christ, then we should be doing things in alignment. That's what I'm coming with tonight. We're still dealing with this angel sounding. But I needed to show you the different breakdowns of these, 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 these angelic hosts, why this is being given an opportunity to come. Now, let, let's go with this, all right? All right, so we showed you Jude 1, 5 through, through 7, right? Bless God, amen. Now we're looking at the ones that have temporary freedom. That's the ones that you're going to be dealing with tonight as we deal with the abyss, all right? As we deal with the abyss. Now watch this now. These who have temporary freedom, they periodically are restrained in the abyss. You've seen that word. I showed you that you're going to come and see that word. That word is being used interchangeably to reference the bottomless pit that you saw in Revelation chapter 9. The one that this fallen angel had the key to open it up. All right? Now watch this now. Let's see how they get down. Matthew chapter 8, verse 28 through 32, and Luke 8, 28 through 32. Ironic that it's the same lineup. Watch this now. And when he came, he was come to the other side in the country of Genesaret, right? There met him two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fear, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to what? To torment, to torment us before the time. Now, they're being specific when they say before the time because they are aware of some things that's going on. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25, we bring that up a lot around here. He knows about the time, so that's why he's trying to tamper with things. But God is sovereign. Let's look at this, verse 30. And they were a good way off you know, from them and a herd of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, if thou cast us out, suffer or allow us to go in away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, go. Hmm. Look, at verse, look at Luke 8. Luke 8, verse 28 through 32. Let's look at that. You're going to see another version of this. And you're going to, get, it's going to explain a little bit more. Look at this. Luke 8, verse 28 to 32 says here, When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. Do you see this? He says for this, For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for oftentimes it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he brake the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because what? Many devils were entered into him. Where did they come from? How come they have this much liberty to move around? What's going on with this? Verse 31, and they besought him. Watch, 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 watch what the fallen angels say to him now. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out where? Into the deep. Do you know what deep he's talking about? The abyss, the bottomless pit. That's where they know that they should be, when I told you, they have temporary freedom. All right? Temporary freedom. 
You ask yourself why all this exists, because it really may, doesn't make sense. If they're all tripping and, 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 and trying to do evil upon the earth, maybe we lock them up and never let them out. But there is a reason, saints of God, for these interactions. God uses them to his whim, not because he chooses to put us in a vicarious position, but it emphasizes our choices. If God manipulated the earth after giving you authority in it, then your salvation would not be valid. Press that in for your mind for a quick second. It would have come through manipulation. Back in Egypt, when you heard that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, you think to yourself that God physically did something to harden Pharaoh's heart. There are many among us that think that. If he had done that, he was manipulating the outcome. That's not God. The way that he's able to do that with Pharaoh's heart is remove himself from it. Because I told you before, in order for you to be man, you have to be in the what? The image and the likeness of God. Your car manufacturer didn't just manufacture your car. You have a Nissan Sentra, right? A Nissan Sentra is a four-door sedan made by Nissan. You also have a 300ZX which is a different model of car, different shape, and different performance. In the earth, without God, you may have a male, but the connotation of man is constituted by the model that has his image and likeness. If I extract that from you, then you become more of a beast in your thinking. <laughs> I pray that you're getting that. That's why I laugh sometimes at people who tell me they're atheists, but they will still run out to go help a lady with some groceries. Oh, no, you're confused. Kindness is, a, is, is, is an attribute or a characteristics of Christ. You think it's just, you know, because of me? No, you're just confused. I want to help you with this, and I want to stay too late tonight. If I go over, saints of God, I'm going to be teaching this going forward. These next set of, you know, the fifth, sixth, and seventh seals are very long in passages, sometimes two, three, you know, passages of Scripture to read. So, you know, we're going to go in this chronologically. So if I don't finish this tonight, we'll continue as we go on. Amen? But all right, let's go in here again. And you see that, that, that he, they, they, in verse 31 of Luke 8, and they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there was a herd and many swine feeding on the mountain, and they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them. Hallelujah. You see, saints of God, that's where, okay, that's where I'm going to bring it down. That's where I'm going to bring it down tonight. Hallelujah. I pray that you were able to see this portion of it, right, and realize that God is allowing, God is allowing the, the, the locusts to come. As I told you, there are individuals in the theological worlds that believe that these locusts are false prophets. They very well might be that, but in my studying and my, con my, my, my consulting with the Lord, you know, I need a little bit more information to, to go ahead and confirm that. But if we went on that theology, if we went on that study, we sort of went on that, that vein, this is showing us that, you know, these, these locusts are not like regular locusts. Regular locusts, you know, they harm the grass. You know, they harm vegetation. They do that. This one has the ability to understand. Okay? So with that, it has intelligence. It's the reason why we lend to this, this being false prophets. That's here that's causing, you know, some ruckus in the land, some individuals to be there. Now, it sounds a little manipulative and, you know, from the standpoint of it's already devastation in the earth. And I do know that I need to make a choice to serve God. The 144,000 are out there ministering the gospel. And so this has been permitted to come to torment man. It's the reason why my spirit is not tremendously settled on that just yet to say that it is false prophets. Because there are those who believe that these are warfare type, you know, um, military units. Um, you know, when you're hearing that the wings, you know, beat like helicopters and stuff like that, they try to draw those references. 
But I think that in, in any event, in any which way that the Lord is going to use this, it's definitely going to be tormentuous to mankind. And based on everything that we had already seen and John had, you know, visualized and conveyed, I think it should be motivating us. Just as when I went to the Lord and I asked him, why only a third that you're doing, you know, that, you, that, that, that you're, you're damaging? And the Lord pointed me to the place and point of saying, hey, listen, I don't want you to concentrate on the third that I destroy. Concentrate on the two thirds that I maintain. In this situation, I felt the same unctioning in my spirit. We could get caught up and drafted up in the whole, you know, the locust is a mechanized unit and all this other kind of stuff. No. I think the just that we leave here with is understanding that God has given them permission to torment man. And that torment is going to come to those who are not sealed. And the 144,000 are out there ministering the gospel during that phase, right, to bring people to Christ. And we understand that this might be us and this might be, right, our, 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 the ones that come after us in our generations. So it should equip us to understand the importance of evangelizing. It should equip us to the importance of taking God seriously. If you're going to take anything away from this, it's not to debate whether or not a locust is a helicopter or whatever it is. It is to learn and to realize the importance of why God has given us life every single day and given us an opportunity and grace. I think he's deserving of a praise right there because you know what? There's a lot that's going on in the earth today. There's a lot that's going on in the earth today. Killings all over the place. And still having politicians wonder why, if, you know, if, if we need gun legislation or whatever have you. That's a debate. Is that a debate at this particular time? Saints of God, if we're dealing with that in the drizzle, what would the downpour look like? This is why when we begin to see it, right, and the fiery pit is opened, and that smoke comes out from out of there, there are some things that's operating in the spirit realm that's right around us. And we are oblivious if we do not study his word. They were given permission to come out of here. You know that this is not a regular locust because, you know, it, it's, it's imprisoned. Why would God imprison a regular locust? <laughs> no. These are angelic hosts that have been given an assignment for five months to do some things to mankind. It's already devastating, saints of God. We have to have a heart for God because he still, in all of this, wishes that none would perish. But man keeps turning their back on him. Sometimes we do that with just the littlest thing. You got you some provisions today. Well, for goodness sake, say a blessing over your meal. Don't just dig your fork into it, you know what I mean, and, and, and just get down. Don't forget that he's the one that gave you the ability to be provided for. Simple things like that. You wake up in the morning and you reach for your phone because you know what? You think Facebook kept you, you know, kept you sleeping last night. You're out of consciousness and something is going on with your inhale and your exhales. Your heartbeat is beating. You are realizing that you are alive every time you wake up because you didn't have to. And still there is a struggle to get on 6 a.m. prayer. Oh, bless God. Still, you're still here with knowing all of this. Getting comfortable in your lifestyles. Making excuses that I haven't even set my alarm clock. You would if you had a job. You would if you had to go show up at the job. You would. But you see, you don't take God seriously. You don't. Some of us don't. And that's why I'm encouraging you. You know, to press forward and do what God sent you to do here so that you can teach the generations. You don't have any children? Somebody's still looking up to you. You have influence over somebody else's child, somebody else in your, in your, on, your, on your level as well. Have you encouraged them in the Lord? Have you encouraged yourself in the Lord? That's what we take away from all of this, is that we know that this judgment is going to come. 21 judgments. That was leveled against the earth. Broken up in series of sevens. We got to make sure we're doing what we're sent here to do, saints of God. We can't get so caught up in what's been going on in our own lives that we forget the agenda of the kingdom. Say amen. I pray to all God that you receive something from this. 
And the next time we continue, you know, I'll bring back some stuff and now we'll just continue to press forward and let the Holy Spirit have his way. I pray tonight that your hearts and your minds are open enough to receive of the Lord. And if you felt that, you know, somewhere along the line you fell short and you want to get yourselves right with God, we can do that right now. You don't have to wait. You don't need an appointment. You can do that right now. And ask the Lord to come into your life and show you. He's a really loving God. Amen? Let's go to God in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you again for this day. I thank you for the opportunity. I thank you for prayer. I thank you for the intercessors. I thank you, Lord God, for those who even lift up my hands. As Aaron and her, Lord God. I pray, oh God, in the name of Jesus, that I will continue to do what you sent me in the earth to do. And to make an impact, Lord God. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would gain glory from our lives. And for those of us in the studio audience, the local body, those in the international community, whether in the live or the rebroadcast, that hears this message tonight. I pray that what's taken away from it, Lord God, is the responsibility that we have in the fact that you gave us life every day. And so I pray now, Lord Father, for anyone who's coming before you with a repentive heart, knowing, Lord God, that they're willing to correct their ways, that you would hear them, because a broken and a contrite heart you will not turn away from, Lord God. You will not refuse. And so I pray that you will touch them right where they are, Lord God. And for those, Lord God, who are coming to give their lives to you, Lord Father, we pray now that you would see their heart, Lord God, and perform the heart surgery that is necessary. That you will hear them, Lord God, as they utter and confess their sins before you, Lord God. We all had to do it, and we brought ourselves before you, Lord God. And you cleaned us up. And so I pray for them, Lord God, that you will touch and you will heal them and you will deliver them just the same. We thank you, Lord God, for giving them the insight and the ability to come. I pray now, Lord God, for those of us who maybe have fallen short. We all will fall short of your glory. But you give us a path through Yeshua and through his blood to be redeemed and to be restored. And I pray, oh God, that your hands will not be short concerning us. We're believing you for a lot, Lord. And we're asking and thanking you in advance, Lord Father, for positioning us to prosper. And now, God, in the name of Jesus, I seal this session here. And we leave this place, but never from your presence, knowing that you're going to be with us in and out of season. I pray now, Lord God, that you give a blessing unto all of us as we go forward and to bless the seeds of the individuals who will desire and been, been moved to sow to the ministry. I pray, oh God, that you'll bless them in this season as even as you're blessing us here in the house. We are careful to give you all the grace, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. As we together say, amen and amen. Saints of God, I thank you for bearing with me tonight as I stepped out here a little tired, but I definitely want to make sure that you gain something from this and to be back here again. Now, Friday morning, you're going to be on there with 6 a.m. prayer. I'm going to campaign and campaign. And those of you who are out there, don't get tired in evangelizing. Send it out to somebody because you don't know what a person is going through and how much of a breakthrough it could be for them in that moment. Don't become complacent. Become committed. We'll see you at 6 a.m. on Friday morning, right? And we'll take it from there until the next appointed time. We love you. Christ loves you. Make sure you deliver it to love somebody back. Bless God.